you're on. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the Friends of the DAO uh, Saturday Night Star Party. Uh, my name is Aaron Bannister and I'll be emceeing this uh, evening. And uh, I've got a very special speaker, Bob McDonald, uh, with us today. Um, just a uh, one or two things before we get started. Um, I just want to uh, remind everyone about our uh, gift shop online. Um, you can access that by going to centeroftheuniverse.org. Uh, we offer free shipping uh, within the Victoria area. Uh, drop off right at your door uh, and other shipping options for further afield. And let's see, um, I just wanted to highlight something for you. Um, we recently had the Mars Perseverance rover land on Mars. Uh, this was launched by NASA last year. And recently we got some video of it that I'm going to share with you here. So this is video from the lander itself as it touches down on Mars. Let's see if I can share this here. Share. All right, can everyone see that? Excellent. So um, what we're going to see are the, uh, some views from different cameras on the lander itself. So it'll start off with a view from the back of the rover as the parachute, as the back shield separates and the parachute unfurls. Uh, this parachute slows the rover down to subsonic speeds. And uh, you might notice that the parachute's pattern is uh, asymmetric and a little interesting. There's actually a coded message on that uh, parachute. See if you can figure it out. And once it's um, slowed down, the heat shield separates. And now we're seeing the camera's first view of the Martian surface as it, um, as it lands. And right now it's scanning the surface with um, radar and a camera. It uses a... Uh, advanced uh, camera system to scan the surface for hazardous features so that it can actually maneuver on its way down to select the perfect landing site. They have sort of a wide range where it can land and then uh, this camera and the onboard software um, figures out a nice clear patch for the camera, uh, for the lander to land. And then, okay, it's about six and a half kilometers off the ground. Seeing the, uh, you can see the edge of the crater there. And that's, uh, very shortly here, we're going to see the parachute separate. See. Starting to see uh, some finer details like uh, windswept dunes on the Martian surface. And it's getting its uh, rocket engines ready. Oh, the navigation system has chosen a landing spot. So you can see the uh, descent is stabilizing a bit now. It's using its thrusters. Now the back shield is um, separated off and it's veered off course or uh, veered off to the side to avoid crashing into that uh, parachute section again. And so now it's slowly coming back on uh, track to its landing site. And in a moment here, you'll start to see dust being kicked up off the surface. So it's falling and right about now it'll start. Yeah, here the rockets are active and it's slowly coming down, slowly coming down. There's the dust being blown away. And now we can see the rover separating from that sky crane. So the top video is from the, um, from the rover, bottom video is from the sky crane. The rockets don't appear to have anything coming out of them, but uh, that's just because Mars' atmosphere is so thin. Um, but you can definitely see their effect on the ground. Rover has touched down, and now the sky crane is going to fly away so that it doesn't crash into the rover. And there we are. So that happened just um, a few weeks ago. And oh, let me stop sharing. And we'll be talking more about the, um, the or Perseverance Lander and 
the other Mars missions that have recently arrived to the Red Planet uh, after Bob's time. Let's see. And I believe next we have um, a brief um, summary of what's up in the sky right now from Don. So I'll turn it over to Don. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, I'll share my screen. And I'm just going to share Stellarium here. And so what we're seeing here is a view from Stellarium. Uh, oops. Oh, I'm just uh, having, having a little technical difficulty here. Sorry. Seems to be the theme for tonight. And we'll get back to that in just a second here. There we go. And you should see my, my full screen, but uh, nevertheless, I'll be able to see the sky. So hi, everybody. I'm Don. And this is a current view of the nighttime sky through the Stellarium program. And again, this is free, and it works on, uh, works on multiple platforms. So uh, please download it if you're interested. And you can see that pretty much due south right now, you can see the constellation Orion. And I'll just put some constellation on, lines on there to help you see it. And as, uh, as I said last month, you can see the winter triangle formed by Betelgeuse, Procyon, and Sirius over here. And if you look over to the uh, southwest, high in the southwest, you can see Mars is up there. So we we're just discussing Mars. And of course, it's really fun to go out and actually look for it. And it's, uh, I have to say that it is uh, kind of confusing if you're looking for it, if, uh, especially if there's a little bit of cloud up there, because you can get it easily confused for Aldebaran over here and because of its reddish color, or maybe even Betelgeuse, if you're not sure exactly where you're looking. But on a clear night, uh, you should be able to see Mars up there with a very distinctive color. And if you look really close to it, you can see that it's close to the star cluster, the Pleiades, which is a relatively young group of stars, about 100th the age of our sun and it'll be moving past this cluster over the next week or so. So you might wanna watch that. You can actually see Mars's movement in the sky relatively, quick, uh, relatively easily from night to night. And so there's no other bright planets that are up in the evening sky at the moment, but in the morning sky, you can actually uh, see Saturn, which is quite well placed. And uh, so I encourage you to look for that. One thing to note is that sunset time does change quite rapidly over the next month, especially with the change in time. And so sunset is gonna be a little bit more than an hour later by the end of March. And so that's, uh, uh, so if you add the change in time, it's really a, a jump of about two hours. So your stargazing will have to start quite a bit later by the end of the month. So that's about it for me and back to everybody else. Thank you. All right, thank you, Don. Um, next up, we have um, a brief uh, uh, interlude on uh, the First Nations moons from Lori. Uh, Lori Roach, let's head over to her. Hey, hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen here. And okay, does it? There we go. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. we can. Um, so I've, I'm just doing a little bit of some things on naming the moons because it's really interesting to see uh, what happens over the time uh, when the when as the moons go from full to um, full through the the whole phase, set of phases over this series of months is we're fairly used to them, but the naming of the moons has been something that's gone on for quite for a very very long time. And um, so a very long time, the North American indigenous um, people have been um, counting and naming um, moons according to their lunar revolutions so the, as how the moon goes around rather than about and rather than for the earth to go around the sun. So the moon goes around in about 29 and a half days, but um, and they would count, they would count their their calendars according to the full moons. Our Gregorian calendar um, with its 12 months and a varying days between 28 and 31 in order for us to have the are they to have our days our 365 and a quarter days be part of the um, the Earth's revolution around the sun so they don't quite mix uh, match up and that's why many of the cultures have got 13 moons 
in a year rather than our 12 so once a once a month we have 13 moons and this is actually fairly well known um, right across many many of the different cultures they name the moons according to the natural weather patterns and the ecosystems that changed around them um, over the the entire month and they would start from the naming of the of uh, when e either from when the, the, the full moon started to the next full moon and they would actually often uh, there was a couple of ones that they would actually go on the lookout for when the very, very first very slim little moon would would start after the new moon and then it would go to that next one. So it just it depended on which on which they were what they were uh, working from and the naming was very regional and very specific. So even within uh, uh, cultures, there'd be, an, uh, there'd be uh, one group that would be kind of in the eastern portion of, a, of say, um, a Saskatchewan, and they would name it differently than the western portion of, uh, portion of Saskatchewan. Um, and they just, they didn't line up so that in between for our traditional calendar for months, um, they, they can vary within the years. So it, it's not always that on, on, on uh, February the 28th or 27th, there's going to be the same kind of thing at all. It moves around all the time. Um, so I was talking about the 13 moons. Our Saanich, uh, our Saanich um, peoples that live on the peninsula, just like right where we are, um, is um, uh, it has, has a calendar for the 13 moons. And as you can see, we're right here in February. So I'm, I honestly am not very good about the pronunciation of these. Um, so I'm not going to try, but um, but but this is the frog moon um, right here, and um, uh, that that the beginning of the frog moon is is for our kind of February time. But you can see that it goes through and very much related to to um, uh, the frogs for seaweed, sockeye mm -hmm. salmon, all the way around for first frost leaves. And even this one, kind of the putting the paddles away, like you can just imagine what is happening in the different places for um, for how the moons are how the moons are um, are named, and so that that's ours right here where where we are. Um, but um, oh, I'm not able to change my screen. Isn't this weird? <laughs> it's not moving to the next one. Um, anything more, my, my computer is just simply stopped. Oh dear. Okay. One of those nights. But what I did want to, um, to tell you was that the, with the sandwich moon, with the, with the frog, but we also know that our, that at this time of year, the different, different communities acro across, um, BC and Washington and Oregon are looking at, at cooler, at cooler times and, um, and and things starting to grow even around here because we have a little bit warmer temperatures. We have um, the namings of the moons are are much more toward what's happening for just the beginning of spring. Whereas out in the out in the east coast and on the prairies, there are names like the snow moon and the cold moon and the hunger moon because that's when people went hungry. Um, there was also the goose moon um, up in the up in the Haida. And um, uh, so there's there's a variety of ways in which we talk about that. Um, so I'm going to see what I can do about possibly maybe at the end of the presentation, I'll see what I can do about getting back on. But I did want to show you one um, one thing that you can have a look at um, that's really important as well. And this is the new the Sky News magazine that comes out of the RASC has got a complete um, uh, a complete article here on the Mi'kmaq um, the Mi'kmaq um, uh, thirteen moons as well and their calendar uh, and what's happening uh, what's happening with them and they call their moon at about at in between kind of February and March the snow blinding moon because the snow is so um, is so much. So if you can pick up a copy of the Sky News or if RASC members have got the Sky News magazine that um, that uh, the the um, uh, Mi'kmaq moon cycle is in um, is in there. So I'm just going to stop right now and um, hopefully uh, I can get things back again. Thanks very much. Sorry. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Laurie. Um, all right, so with uh, thanks for everyone's patience on our uh, slight technical difficulties, I'd like to move along to our feature presentation. Uh, so with us, we have Bob McDonald, 
Uh, Bob is a science journalist and author best known for hosting the Quirks and Quarks uh, show on CBC Radio. And um, he's also an author and most recently he's authored the book An Earthling's Guide to Life in Space, uh, available from our gift shop website. We're privileged to have him on the board of the Friends of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory and as our speaker tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming Bob for his talk on the potential and pitfalls of sports in space. Thank you very much, Aaron. And uh, I've, I've been having some technical difficulties as well. So hopefully we can make this happen. And uh, Ben, I sent you the video of uh, my video uh, to email. So maybe you can play it when I come to that. Um, it was really great seeing the landing on Mars. I mean, it was so thrilling. I don't know how many of you watched it live, but it's uh, just a, an emotional event. I've been to some of those events, uh, Mars landings, uh, planetary flybys at the Jet Propulsion Lab at Mission Control. And I've got to tell you, it's it's just a, an emotional thing because everything can go wrong at the last second and it has gone wrong at the last second. So to see a, a successful landing is always a great thrill. And what I'm looking forward to next, and maybe Aaron's going to talk about this after my presentation, is the helicopter. For the first time, we have a flying machine on another world and it's going to give us some aerial shots, which we've never, ever had before. So it's going to be a really, really great mission over the next few years uh, to really keep an eye on that. So the uh, I, I've been following planetary exploration for most of my career. Uh, I was at the Viking mission in 1976 when we landed on Mars with the uh, first American landing on Mars with the first colored cameras, first looking for life. And in I've, I've been to every planet in the solar system, including Pluto, which isn't even a planet anymore. And throughout this, you can't help but think, well, what's it like there? And what would it like to be there? What, what would it like to uh, be like to, to actually go visit these places? So what I would like to share with you tonight is uh, some of the vacation spots that I've already chosen in space and some of the things that we could do out there. And uh, so that's uh, this. You know, I took a, I had a, um, an opportunity to fly on a zero G airplane, which is what they use to train astronauts, except this one is a uh, commercial version. And it's one that you can buy a ticket on. It's called zero G. It's not cheap, but I was uh, writing and hosting a television series for kids called heads up at the time, which is the best way to get into doing something is to get somebody else to pay for it. And so we, um, it's a 727 cargo plane that they, uh, they only have a few seats in the back. The floor is padded. The walls are padded. They fly out over the Atlantic ocean we flew out of fort lauderdale and they go out over the ocean and they perform these roller coaster moves um, where they, they go up over a parabola they follow a parabolic flight path which is the natural path that anyone anything in space follows and um, that you throw into in the air that follows a parabola so you get 30 seconds over the top of zero g and then when they pull it up at the bottom you get uh, two G's. So you go from nothing to twice your weight to nothing to twice your weight. But what surprised me about this is that the first two parabolas that they flew, um, they gave us partial G's because the pilots are actually flying it. And so they just reduced our weight a little bit. So on the first one, you'll see the gravity of Mars, and uh, which is one third of a G. And then on the second one, you'll see one six, which is the gravity of the moon. And uh, that's really quite, <laughs> quite amazing. So Ben, if you can run the video, let's see what happens. See uh, well, first of all, let me share my screen. Can you see that? There it is. Yay. Now let's see if it goes. The zero G airplane does the same thing in the air. But it's it working? Bigger hills yep. and valleys. When an airplane is flying along a straight line, everyone feels the same force of gravity that they do standing on the ground. That's 1G for gravity. But if the plane flies in a hump pattern, it's like going over the top of the hill. The people inside will feel lighter. And if they feel one third of their weight, that's the gravity of Mars. If the plane flies over a steeper hump, 
for people who feel lighter still. At one sixth of our weight, we feel like we're walking on the moon. And if the plane flies a really steep path through the air, we'll feel no weight at all, just like the astronauts in space. Well, the video, the sound is cutting out, but uh, here I am at uh, zero G. And I'm going to try to throw a ball, but I can't get to it because I'm stuck in the middle of the room. <laughs> uh... Oh, no, it froze. Uh... <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> Of course, the pilot is in the plane too, so he feels the same thing. How does he know when he's got it just right? What I do is I hold a pencil or a pen, and I really let it go, and then I watch the pen. But officially, I have an accelerometer. What this meter does, right now you can see it reads one, one Earth's gravity. When we have it right, this reads zero, and we have it accurate enough to read to a hundredth of a D for a gravity. Much okay, we can stop, man. <laughs> yeah, pretty goofy. Um, it didn't matter what I did in that. It's, uh, I seemed to land on my head every time, <laughs> which was uh, a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, so Ben, if you can get back to my screen, I've reloaded my PowerPoint, so maybe I can make it work this time. Yeah, uh, send, it, send it to me as well. Uh, well, I'm kind of trying to do just do my talk here. Uh, yeah, I know. But, yeah okay well if you stop sharing there we are so let me um let me try one more time see if i can uh, share my presentation here with you and hopefully you will see this and hopefully i can go to um our slideshow and are we seeing that yes okay hey it works <laughs> so so here's our, uh, our hero, Chris Hadfield, having fun in space with his guitar. Everyone who goes up there has a good time. And as you just saw, that was the plane that I was in, the zero G plane. And it was just glorious uh, having this opportunity to float around like that. I now understand why astronauts move in slow motion, because when you're floating freely like that, if you touch anything, you just start floating in the opposite direction. You tumble end over end and you have no control over yourself until you hit the opposite wall. So you got to plan where you want to go and, and push off very slowly and, and use your fingertips. And it, it, I also found that it's easier to go head first because that feels like you're rising up. If you go feet first, it feels like you're falling down, even though there's no difference. There is no up or down. So I, I understand why astronauts move in slow motion. But did you notice during the moon gravity, like I did that standing backflip, if I tried that here, I'd break every bone in my body, but uh, I, I, the gravity was really, really low on the moon. And uh, I, I fell slowly when I jumped up, you come down slowly. So if we wanna play sports on the moon, it's gonna be amazing because you'll be able to jump so high. You could jump up to the second floor. You don't need stairs. You could jump up and you could jump down. You won't hurt yourself. You'll just float down. So this uh, really changes the way we think about uh, being in space. And uh, so zero G is, is certainly a lot of fun to, uh, to fly around. And 
we uh, this was one time when we had two uh, Canadians in space at the same time enjoying zero G. That's Bob Thirsk and Julie Payette, who's kind of in everybody's bad books right now. This is before she was governor general. But uh, we had two Canadians in space. That was the only time that ever happened. And they always play around in uh, in zero G having a really great time. Um, when I was a kid, they we had cartoons and uh, comic books and magazines that were telling us that one day we would be taking vacations in space and the whole family would be going out and we would have holidays on the moon and up in space stations. And, uh, you know, Buck Rogers and all of these things that we'd be roaming around the solar system having a great time. It hasn't quite happened yet, but we're getting close. We're getting a little closer to it. I'm not sure it'll happen in my lifetime, but perhaps we'll start uh, visiting other worlds. Now you can, if you uh, call this company, you can book a trip up to the International Space Station. They'll put you up on a Russian Soyuz rocket. I think the latest price, the, the last person uh, to do it was Gila Liberté, who uh, founded Cirque du Soleil. And I think the current price is roughly $50 million to get a seat on, uh, on a Soyuz. Uh, here I am sitting in a Soyuz capsule with Bob Thirsk. They're really small. Uh, I, was, I was really surprised how small they are. It's a three seater and believe it or not, there's a seat between us. So you're sitting shoulder to shoulder with your knees up. It's just a little tiny little ball. But the Soyuz is, is the most reliable form of space transport we have. It hasn't changed much since Yuri Gagarin went up. And it's just a taxi. It's only to get you up and back. And uh, so that's OK. You can put up with sitting in a small space for a short time. And um, the people who have paid, this was the first, uh, first guy to go up. Um, and he paid $30 million to, uh, to go into uh, space. And um, I don't know, Dennis Tito was his name. And when he first went up, I wondered who he was, other than somebody who was very rich. And uh, I had a theory. Um, he looks like Dr. Evil, don't you think? I mean, look, there's Dennis Tito. There's Dr. Evil and Minnie me the same guy what do you think i don't know maybe but uh, anyway he paid 30 million dollars to go up into space and uh, had a really good time for one week on the international space station and our last person was canadian uh gila liberté and he paid 50 million to uh, to do that so that's the kind of vacation you can take at the moment if you have that kind of money if you don't have that kind of money uh you can go up on the uh spaceship two at uh, going to New Mexico. I went down there a couple of summers ago to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And I thought maybe they would be flying this thing on that day, but absolutely nothing was happened there. Uh, even though Richard Branson said he was going to do it, it still hasn't flown. But for only, uh, what is it, uh, $50,000, you can get a flight on this uh, six seater and uh, be taken up by the White Knight carrier aircraft to 50,000 feet. The rocket engine ignites, you go straight up and you go up just to the edge of space. You go up to hundred kilometers and everybody sitting in their seats gets a few minutes of weightlessness, basically doing the same thing that I did when I was on the zero G airplane, except they just go a whole lot higher and the parabola is much larger. So instead of getting 30 seconds, they get a few minutes and they see the blackness of space and the curvature of the earth. And then uh, after that, they got to strap back in and land on the same runway they took off. So the whole thing happens in, uh, in one morning. Now uh, that's for 50,000. The other, uh, the other one is uh, Jeff. Uh, oh, there they are floating around inside. The other one is Jeff Bezos and his uh, Blue Origin spacecraft, which goes straight up and then straight down. It, it takes <laughs> and it lands by parachute again. So it's just, um, again, the same thing. You just get a couple of minutes of weightlessness. And look at the size of this thing. The, the, the nice thing about it is that the windows are, are really, really large. Uh, so, But it's just, again, just straight up and straight back. So if you want to pay... 50,000 bucks or so for a few minutes in space, you can do that. But this is just, I mean, this is just dipping our toe in the, in the ocean. It's not really going for a, for a full swim, but a lot of people have signed up for these things. So space tourism is happening. That's, that's, that's at least a good thing. I have, a, I have a feeling in the future, they're gonna look like this. Um, they're gonna look like NASCAR. <laughs> We're gonna have uh, uh, sponsorships on the outside.
and your spacesuit will have all these logos on it from all the sponsors to make these things happen. Uh, the place to go at the moment, if you want to go to uh, live in space is the International Space Station. Wonderful thing, but it wasn't designed as a hotel. It's a laboratory and it's not really built for comfort. There's your bedroom. Uh, it's about the size of a phone booth. Now you are weightless, but um, it's still pretty small. You have your laptop in there and uh, you can close it off for privacy. You hang on the wall to sleep. Uh, this one is in the Japanese module. He's just on the wall of the module itself. You let your arms float out in front of you. Apparently sleeping in space is very comfortable, but um, it's not really, really a hotel. When I was a kid, again, we were told about great hotels in space that would be gigantic wheels, like the kind that was in the, uh, the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. And these wheels would slowly rotate and create artificial gravity on the outside so that you could walk around in there. You wouldn't be floating weightless all the time, at least not on the outer rim of the wheel. So it could be a lot, be a lot like a hotel here on Earth except the earth would be outside the window. So you could have a lobby of a hotel like we have here. You can sit and have drinks and enjoy things. The earth would be rotating in that window, by the way, very, very slowly going around and around. Um, you could have a dining room like we have dining rooms here. Um, enjoy your dinner. Uh, afterwards, you could have a little dancing, a little romancing, and then you could retire to your bedroom with this incredible view out the, out the window. Although I've thought about this, and um, I think if I was going to go into space, I would really like to have a zero G bedroom. I mean, think about that. You know, when you're when you're all curled up with your honey, there's always a leftover limb. There's there's always some limb you don't know what to do with, or you're lying on something and falls. You know, you get all weird. In space, you'd be floating freely. You could you could get into so many positions and I, I think it would be amazing anyway that's just my little thing sorry about that so um yeah here was an idea for a space station concept that was uh, in the early days of the space shuttle the uh, when the space shuttle was flying the giant tank the fuel tank that was on its belly uh, you can see one behind me here they threw those away they they crashed into the indian ocean uh, they were only used once and there was an idea, why not just put little engine on them and put them up into orbit? They're huge, they're hollow, they're airtight, and put them into rings to make them into a space station. I thought this was a fabulous idea. And there are two rings. The outer one would be the Earth gravity, and the inner one would be moon gravity. So that people going to the moon could practice moon gravity before they go there by spending some time in the inner ring, and people coming back from the moon could get used to Earth gravity around the outside. So I thought that was, it was kind of a neat idea to uh, have a two ring spacecraft like that. But like all hotels, uh, good hotels have swimming pools. So what would a swimming pool in space be like? Well, you could put a conventional pool in any one of those uh, outer modules and it would, because there's one G out there, it would behave like a pool on earth. And that's, that's okay. But I think it would be much more interesting to put a swimming pool in the center axis. And I thought about this and I commissioned an artist to draw me a concept that I had for a swimming pool in space. And here's what it looks like. Now get your head into this. Imagine a drum that rotates so that the water sticks to the inside walls. The drum rotates at a constant speed. So the water would catch up and then it would go still. It would go calm and it would be like a regular pool. Except you can crawl or you can swim all the way around the, the walls. You can, you can swim up around the ceiling and around the other way. You could go all the way. You will notice at the end where the big window is that looks out on the earth, there's a walkway. There's uh, somebody sitting there in a chair. There's one G there so they could walk all the way around. There's also a diving board um, right here. There's a person diving. So it would act like a regular pool. You could swim around. However, you will also notice that there are ladders that go up to this central red tube here in the middle. That's along the center axis. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the steps of the ladder get wider and wider as you go up. That's because as you approach the center, you get lighter and lighter until you're like this guy here, you are floating weightless. This is where the lifeguards are. They're in the center. From this center position, 
you could dive in any direction, any direction you want. That would be astounding. And because this thing is rotating, when you take a dive, as soon as you push off, when you're in free space, you're going to move in a straight line. But the object, the, the pool will move underneath you. So you won't hit the spot you aim at. You will, you'll have to, if you want to cannonball this girl down here, you have to aim ahead and to, to get her. So you would be traveling in a straight line. You would see the pool moving around you. But for the people in the water, if you were still in the water, you'd be moving with it. And that would be your frame of reference. If you watch somebody floating through the air, they would appear to follow a curve. Just think about it. It's really weird physics, but I, I, we've got to do this. We've got to do something like this. It's just to get a swimming pool in space. So this was my, my concept that uh, I had an artist draw for me. So that's the swimming pool. So we go to the moon. This is a drawing from um, Jules Verne's time. And uh, even back then they were talking about sports on the moon and how the one sixth gravity, things like high jumps would be six times higher and uh, you could jump really high. So <laughs> what could we do on the moon? Well, imagine a basketball game. Your slam dunks would be over the, the basket. You could actually jump over the basket and push the ball straight down into it. I guess the scores would be a lot higher because everyone could, uh, could jump so high. <laughs> the ball would also bounce a lot higher and your, uh, your, your runs, you'd, you'd be running in a, in a very, very different way on low gravity. So it'd be a very, very different game. We'd probably have to expand the court because people would be killing each other running into one another as they, as they play the game. Um, here's another uh, sketch from the same artist who did the pool. Um, we, it's just a rough sketch, but you pour a little concrete into the craters on the moon, some of the smaller craters, and turn them into half pipes and uh, do a little skateboarding there. Look at all the air time you would get uh, by skateboarding or um, stunt bicycle riding in, uh, in some of the craters of the moon. That'd be fun to do. You have to wear a spacesuit to do it, but that's okay. You could, you could still do that. Uh, we had um, lunar rovers on the moon on the last three missions. And I think the top speed they did was 11 kilometers per hour downhill. Um, I think Gene Cernan set the record for that. But uh, maybe that will change in the future since we now have uh, Formula E electric cars uh, perhaps we could uh, have some interesting Formula E races on the moon. Of course, the dust kicked up by those would be quite astounding. And the, the suspension might have to be a little larger, but it's a, it's a fun thing to, uh, to think about. Um, after the moon, our uh, next trip out is to Mars, of course. Uh, it's the only planet really that we can visit. Everything else is either too hot, too cold, or too gassy and not really habitable. Well, maybe, I've, I've got another spot we might be able to go to. And um, as you can see here at the upper left is the uh, polar caps. There's a polar cap at both the North and South Pole. And before we get to Mars, it has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. This was a picture taken by a mission called Phobos that the Russians sent. And unfortunately, this was, um, I think this was the last picture it took, one of the only and last pictures that it took before a faulty command killed the whole mission and it was lost. Uh, it was supposed to land on Phobos, which would have been amazing. Uh, there are some talks about if we go to Mars before landing there, that the first human mission might actually land on Phobos first. Uh, it's very small. It's, it's only uh, like 30 or so kilometers across. So it would fit within the greater Victoria and Saanich area, uh, like between downtown and the the ferry dock, maybe just a bit beyond that, up to Salt Spring or something. So it's it's probably a captured asteroid. And if you could go there, you could you could have a very interesting time because the gravity would be so low on Phobos or an astronaut, you would be almost zero. You'd you'd, you'd almost have no weight at all. I think on Phobos, your weight you'd weigh about as much as a pencil. So you would be Superman or Supergirl. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but the original story of Superman was that he couldn't actually fly. He could, for those of you of my generation, when there was a Superman television show, it opened with um, able to leap over tall buildings in a single bound. He leaped. He didn't fly. He leaped. 
And that's because his home planet Krypton was more massive than the Earth and had higher gravitational field. So his body was adapted to a high gravity environment. When So on the Earth, he was super strong, which made him leap. Well, we Earthlings are adapted to a much higher gravitational field than Phobos. So if you went there, you would be able to literally leap over tall buildings. In fact, uh, if you jumped, you could probably go half a kilometer high or so before you'd come down. And it would take you quite a while to come down because you'd fall so slowly. But you could leap all the way around the moon in about um, a dozen steps, a dozen jumps. So that, <laughs> that would be... Uh, That'd be amazing to be able to fly. You, you could fly on Phobos. You wouldn't need a spaceship. You wouldn't need power packs or anything. Just, just leap wherever you want to go. And that brings up um, an interesting idea for uh, baseball. You could have an interesting game of baseball to yourself. Now, again, can you still see me here in the picture? Um, actually, maybe let me, let me just uh, stop sharing so you can see me more. Uh, yes, we can see you as well. Here, am I more full screen now? <laughs> um, yeah, imagine being on this little little tiny moon and uh, you you're, you face the horizon, you have a baseball. So you face the horizon, which would be very close to you. It would just drop off. It'd feel like you're standing on top of a mountain. But if you threw the ball and you just gave it a really good pitch, you would put the ball in orbit. And it would take about 20 minutes for the ball to make it all the way around Phobos. So you go have a coffee and then you come back 20 minutes later and face the other direction with a bat. And the ball would come over the horizon. If you hit it, home run, you'll never see it again. It'll escape. But if you miss, strike one, the ball will continue to orbit because there's no atmosphere there. It will continue around. So go have another cup of coffee or dessert or something. Come back 20 minutes later as the catcher. Whack! Strike one. Kind of a long game, but uh, it'd be fun to do. I, I don't know. I think I just think it'd be fun to do. <laughs> uh, where was I here? Yes. So that's... Um, that's on Phobos. Uh, hopefully we'll keep going here. Oh, damn, I shouldn't have stopped sharing screen. Okay, let me try this again. Wow. All right, let's go back to this one. Maybe I can make it happen again. Uh, sorry about these technical uh, miss ups. Yeah, it's not letting me do it. All right, I'll do it this way. Can we see this? Um, okay, sorry, folks. I'm going to have to um, to shut down and restart my PowerPoint. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, anyway, Phobos, uh, yeah, would be fun. On Mars, we could go um, skiing at the North Pole. And um, yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm, rather than show you all these pictures, let me just tell you. <laughs> and a nice, nice reminder here not to uh, stop share screening when I'm <laughs> sharing my screen when we're doing a uh, PowerPoint. Um, there's good skiing at the North Pole of Mars. The, uh, there's ice there, but it's, um, it's dry ice. It's frozen carbon dioxide. So if you were to ski, I'm not sure what kind of wax you would use because it's, it's drier than water ice. So you wouldn't get any of that melting underneath, but I still think you could do it. And the polar cap of Mars is layered. It, it has uh, flat areas and then hills and flat areas and hills. So you could, uh, if you had the kind of mountain skis that trekkers use with detachable um, bindings, so you can trek like cross country across the flats, then you come to a hill and you start skiing down, release your heels and do, do or attach your heels and then go down the hill and do slalom skiing. The problem is if you're on Mars with only one third gravity, um, you, you don't have as much weight, but you still have momentum because you, your mass is the same. So if you get yourself going really fast and you hit a bump, you'll take lots of air, but when you come down, it'll take you a long time to stop <laughs> because the, uh, you, just, you just don't have traction. So if you fall, you will skid and skid and tumble and get covered in snow, and which is the way I ski anyway. Your equipment would be all over the hill, but it would take you a long, long time to stop. The advantage though, is that if you do get your spacesuit, snowsuit, all covered in snow, when you come back into your habitat, you won't leave any puddles on the floor. 
because it's dry ice. It'll just evaporate away. So skiing on Mars, I think will be uh, really quite, quite amazing. Some other things that we might uh, try on Mars is hiking up to the top of Olympus Mons, the tallest volcano in the solar system, twice as high, more than twice as high as Mount Everest. And if you stood on the top of that mountain, you'd almost be in space. Uh, Mars, again, being so small and with such a, um, a thin atmosphere, the sky above you would be black. You would see the curve of the planet. And I wondered about seeing the sunrise from the top of Olympus Mons. The sun would come up over the horizon. The, the atmosphere, the horizon would turn sort of a, an orangey pink as, as the sun comes up, but it would be curved. And the, the sides of the mountain are so smooth, you could just walk up. You, you wouldn't, there, there aren't any steep cliffs. You could just walk right up to the top of it. Take you a while, but again, under the low gravity, it would be easy. Cliff climbing, really easy on Mars. You could just pull yourself up very, very easily uh, on steep face cliffs because the gravity is, uh, is low. Your, your weight is so much less. So Mars is going to be a great playground uh, when we go there. Um, I know Lori was asking the other night about curling on Mars. I'm not sure how a curling stone would work on dry ice, although there is water ice underneath it. So if you clear off the, the snow, you might find the hard ice underneath there. Maybe the curling stones would work there as well. Um, beyond Mars... Uh, um, we get out to uh, we get out to Jupiter, and you might be able to balloon on Jupiter. I've done some hot air ballooning, and uh, the one thing that surprised me is when you're in a hot air balloon, the balloon moves with the air, so it doesn't matter how fast the air is moving, you are perfectly still and calm. So even though Jupiter has these incredible winds that carry, you know, are running along at hundreds of kilometers an hour, if you were in a balloon, you'd, you'd have a fairly, fairly smooth ride. The only problem is you'd be killed by the radiation. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if that's a good idea to balloon on Jupiter. And you'd also feel very heavy because of the high gravity. However, if you went to Io, one of its moons, uh, where there are volcanoes spewing out of the ground. What a beautiful sight that would be is to see the sulfur coming out of the ground and, and forming yellow snow all around you. The ground would be yellow snow. Never eat yellow snow. Well, don't eat it on Io either because it's uh, sulfur. But um, you would have Jupiter filling up a good part of your sky and you have dune buggies races around the sulfur flats of Io. And uh, finally, my other uh, place where we might go is to Saturn and uh, perhaps go for uh, a sailing trip in the seas of Titan. Uh, we know that Titan has methane lakes and we know that it has an atmosphere and there are winds there. They're not very strong, but there are winds. And I'm a sailor and I've wondered what the waves on the Titan lakes would be like. Uh, first, methane is not water. It's lighter than, than water. So I don't know what kind of buoyancy you would get. And under the lower gravity of Titan, whether the waves would be slow and long, what that would be like. But I'd sort of like to find that out. Go sailing or, or take a submarine on, uh, on Titan and, uh, and go around there. And finally, within the rings of Saturn itself, if you could float freely within the rings of Saturn, you would be surrounded by flying snowballs and you could have a three-dimensional snowball fight. You just grab one that passes by and just throw it at somebody. Of course, if you did that, if you threw overhand, you'd tumble end over end in all directions. But what a sight, what a sight you would see. The Saturn's rings from, from one side of the rings to the other side is the distance between the earth and the moon and yet it's only a couple of kilometers thick so you could stick your head above the rings of saturn they're perfectly flat you can see all the way across to the other side underneath with the sun shining through them they'd be glistening there's probably little snowflakes in there you get rainbows and all kinds of things and you'd be going around saturn every 10 or 12 hours and watch the sun set behind saturn just being there would be an amazing experience. So these are some of the things that, uh, that I've thought about, about where we can go when we go into space to have fun out there. All we need is to build the rockets or develop warp drive or something to get ourselves out there as quickly as we can. And um, before I leave you, um, I do want to, again, 
do some crass self-promotion here. Um, if you're looking for things to do during these times, uh, my book, uh, which is available in our bookstore, An Earthling's Guide to Outer Space, has activities in it. I wrote this book for kids, for young people, but I've been finding that adults like it too. And um, But it has things to do with your kids in the home using everyday things. This book is based on questions that uh, kids have asked me, like, What's our cosmic address? Uh, and one of them is, why are black holes black? And um, to the demo, the home demo to do that, I can show you here. Um, it involves a couple of these um, plastic pop bottles. And what you do is you take the caps off these bottles and you cut holes in them that are about the size of your, uh, your little finger here. This, uh, so just, if it fits on the end of your little finger, that's, that's about right. Take the two caps and tape them together with really, really strong waterproof tape so that the threads are facing outwards. Then just put the, uh, put the cap on one of them tightly, fill the other bottle with water, not quite up to the top, and put the two of them together like this. And then carefully <laughs> holding both of them, Turn them upside down and swirl the top one around. And it'll make a, a vortex in the center. It looks like something that's going down your toilet bowl, which it is. But that's probably what an accretion disk around a, a black hole looks like. Swirling around and around and around, getting squeezed tighter and tighter and tighter. And the black hole would be right here. Um, where you go. <laughs> On the other side of the black hole, that's a good question. Is it to another parallel universe that's like this one, but time goes the other way? I don't know. But uh, that's just one of the demos that I have in my book of things that you can do at home as a conversation starter to uh, think about black hole structures, gravity wells, vortices, spaghettification, and all the things that would happen to you if you fell into a black hole. So that's my um, my presentation for tonight. Sorry about all these crazy technical difficulties. Uh, I hope to see you all again soon live uh, up at the uh, center of the universe on top of the mountain. Uh, I look forward again to uh, having star parties there where we can all see each other face to face and share our stories. But uh, with all the limitations that we had tonight, uh, thank you all for joining us. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, now we do, uh, if you have some time, we do actually have some questions already from sure. uh, the YouTube chat and uh, I've got one myself. Um, so first off, on back to Phobos. Um, so you can throw a ball into orbit, you can hit it out of the park, so to speak. Uh, would you yourself be in danger of um, launching so far that you couldn't come back? Um, is there any way you could get off Phobos under your own power? I'm not sure about that. You'd have to you'd have to jump several times. Maybe if you got yourself into some forward momentum. The problem is you don't have much traction, so you'd you'd have to try to push yourself off, uh, like you're in zero g, and get yourself moving across the surface rather than up. And then perhaps when you come down, if you get your momentum going, you might be able to. Uh, to get yourself up to escape velocity. I'm, I'm not sure, that would be that'd be interesting. Of course, if you did, you're lost in space. <laughs> it's gonna um, get a while to come back. I, I wonder about a, a trampoline uh, on Phobos, if you get yourself going off and then uh, someone double bounced you on the trampoline, gave you some mm, a bit of extra momentum. Maybe with some help, yeah. Maybe with yeah. some help you could do it, yeah. Thing is, you couldn't bounce very well on a trampoline because even taking a small step in super low gravity, you just float off the ground. You, you, you can't walk on right. an asteroid. You can't walk on it. You could just standing there, any motion you make, you just float off and then you really, really slowly come back down again. So when he said, so a trampoline, sure, you could, you could jump up, but you'd come down so slowly, you wouldn't have any, any momentum right. to, to, to bend it and spring you up again. Um, <laughs> another question uh, is, uh, what about... Um, battle games in the style of uh, Ender's Game, um, like combat games or like paintball in zero G. Well, um, yeah, you can do that. The, um, your, your projectiles are going to go in perfectly straight lines. So you don't have to worry about uh, ballistic trajectories. It's one thing, uh, but it would be much easier to dodge the target uh, because you could, you could push yourself off. If you were in a cubic room, uh, imagine you could, 
push off and fly around. So it'd be more like, uh, you know, shooting geese, <laughs> but also you would be moving as well. So I think it would actually be harder to hit somebody because it's, it's a double, double motion. So you're moving and your target's moving. So it'd probably be harder to hit kind of like going from earth to Mars, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's really difficult um, to do. What about something like laser tag where you don't um, have the projectiles yeah. to worry about? I suppose that's instant. Yeah, you could do that, but it depends how many things you can hide behind, I guess, and how quickly yeah. you can get to them. <laughs> um, let's see as well. Uh, I had a question about the um, Saturn snowball fights mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, you're in orbit around Saturn, but what about uh, little chunks of rock on like a different orbit coming in from um say further out in the rings, like uh, two snowballs smashed together and suddenly you've got something coming in at a much different velocity. One of the things, one of the things they found about the rings of Saturn is that they're all following very ordered paths. And when you look at them up close, they're all in lines. Uh, it looks like an old fashioned LP, long, they, like they, they're just arranged in lines and there are grooves uh, in it. And uh, so they, they seem to be quite orderly. So they don't, I, I don't know of too much migration between the outer and the inner side. So they, do, they don't seem to cross. There is very, uh, there's a very interaction. There are these two little moons in Saturn's rings called co-orbitals. They share the same orbit, uh, almost. And uh, they, do, they do this very interesting orbital dance. And it would be interesting to stand on one of them. Again, they're, I think they're even smaller than Phobos. But as, as one approaches the other, it's slightly lower and it, the gravitational pull between them, the one that's behind is accelerated. So it goes to a higher orbit. The one that's in front is slowed down. So it goes into a lower orbit and they pass each other like this and then continue on. But during that time when they're passing, they come really, really close. So if you were standing on one of them, you could probably leap up to the other. That's amazing. So, so they're sort of like moons. they're sort of like a binary planet. That's um, right. But then they but separate. They go around. They go around Saturn again in, in their separate orbits until they they catch up. I can't remember what the period is. It's quite long. But they yeah. uh, they actually switch. They're called shepherd moons, and they 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 um, herd particles into lines as well. But they 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 actually switch places as they come by. Yes. Yeah, so so like cool. binary planets, except their um, the orbital period of each other is synced up with the orbital period of Saturn. That's correct. Yeah or uh, of their orbit around Saturn. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Um, Laurie asks, um, if you run on the moon, would you be going slowly? You can go any speed you like. Um, the, uh, your speed is not limited because there's no air and it's as hard as you can run. It's just that your steps are gonna be a lot farther apart. That was one of the things, uh, if you look at the, the footage of Apollo 11, um, Buzz Aldrin was, was jumping around all over the place. He was running, well, he was doing that on purpose. That was part of his job was to test mobility on the moon. So he was running. And later on, they found that it was easier to bunny hop rather than run the way we do with one leg in front of the other. And if you look at some of the later missions, like Apollo 16 up, 16 and 17, 15, 16 and 17, they were, they were hopping. They, they found it was taken uh, easier to do that, to hop like a bunny. So, you, and you can go quite fast that way. But again, the problem is stopping. It's stopping. You gotta, you gotta plan ahead. <laughs> stopping and going around corners. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta plan ahead in low gravity because your yeah. momentum will carry you on. Especially on that really loose regolith. Yes. By the way, that's that's one of the ways when people uh, talk about, you know, the moon landings were fake. I, I say, watch the dust, watch the dust that their feet kick up because it doesn't form clouds. It all the particles go in flat sheets. They all follow ballistic trajectories because they're in a vacuum. Right. So that's they couldn't do that in the studio. Couldn't yeah, you that. make these nice little round puffs of dust. Yeah, around yeah there are no there are no there are no clouds of, of dust. Um. And let's see, uh, Calvin asks uh, another question about curling on Mars. Would curling on dry ice be different than on water ice, like uh, friction, etc.? Yeah, yeah, I think it will, because curling's a strange sport. The, um, the curling stones go the opposite that they would if they were on, um, on, on say, pavement or, or concrete. Because if you, you think about it, the, the leading edge of a curling stone 
if if you put it if you put it on the ground and say it's it's turning turning this way the stone would go that way right it, it would roll like that but curling stones actually roll into their curve they go the other way and it's believed that that's because the friction on the front side is creating a little bit of melting the ice a bit and lowering the resistance on the leading edge compared to the other side or something like that. But curling stones are very, very weird, but that's water ice. Whether or not they would do that on dry ice, I, I, nobody's had a, a dry ice curling rink large enough to try it out. So we'll have to go to Mars to find out. I think you'd probably it would probably depend on the temperature of the curling stones, how much gas you uh, formed in yeah. front. But the but the dry ice doesn't melt, so it's uh, it's it's more of a solid. I think the curling stones would go in the opposite direction. That's just my guess. Right, the but if they were creating dry. gas in front of them, that might push uh, lift them up a bit, a bit like an air hockey table. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So that's all the questions I have uh, from the chat so far. If anyone else has another question, please feel free uh, to throw it in. And we'll pass it along to Bob. Um, while we're waiting on any more, I have one more about the uh, Saturn's rings. Um, you spoke about the shepherd moons. Uh, I know there are several in the rings of, um, of Saturn and they tend to create little waves uh, in the rings behind them. Um, and um, I believe I've read in some sci-fi or other about people like hopping from uh, rock to rock or iceberg to iceberg uh, in these waves, sort of uh, surfing, so to speak, <laughs> the wave of a shepherd moon. Do you think that would be possible? Uh, well, you're talking about individual particles here. So you're that's like saying, could you surf on uh, on a snow blizzard, you know, as, as the snow's <laughs> going by? It's, they're not solid. They're, uh, yeah, um, they're more gravitational. No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. But I will tell you a funny story about that. When I was at the Voyager Saturn encounter uh, in 1981, the, uh, they first discovered that the outer F ring had a kink in it. And they couldn't explain why, because they didn't know about these little embedded moons at that time. And I happened to be sitting beside a fellow, um, and it was just sort of a quiet time. And I just leaned over to him. I had my tape recorder with me, and I thought, well, I'll get some clips from some of the other journalists. And I said, hi, do you mind, would, you, would you like to talk to Kennedy? He said, sure. I said, uh, so just tell me your name. He said, my name's Larry Niven. I almost fell off my chair. He's a science, very famous science fiction writer. Mm -hmm. And so I said, are, are you... Uh, do you find that these the reality of these missions helps feed your mind for future stories? He said, oh, you bet. And sure enough, the following year, he came out with a novel, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was about aliens hiding within the rings of Saturn. And one of them ignites their engine. And the captain says, oh, no, you're going to disturb the ring particles. They'll see us. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> maybe that's what those, um, those curls are. The exhaust vortices from the exhaust of alien engines. <laughs> that would be interesting, yeah. Um, and uh, to answer Calvin's question, yes, um, Larry Neven is the author of Ring World, among other um, right. popular. Yeah. But there's another one that he did that had these, th they look like elephants and they were inside a spaceship. Yeah. Neat. Um, yeah. Let's see what else we got uh, from Dennis. Um, what diameter did you foresee that pool in space? And I guess. Uh, on top of that, what, um, how fast do you think it would have to be rotating for that? Uh... Right. Well, those two are related, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the smaller it is, the faster it has to rotate. And uh, so uh, the problem is that water is very heavy and getting water into space is a, is a very expensive proposition. But uh, I haven't worked out the mathematics, but I think if you're about 100 meters across, that'd be a good size. And okay. you could, it, could, it could rotate slowly enough that you wouldn't be bothered by all the Coriolis forces. But um, I, yeah. I, I think it, yeah, I think it could rotate probably about, you know, once a minute or so, It'd probably give you enough G. You don't need one G. You can have, you could have partial G's, just enough to hold the water in. Yeah. Which would also make the diving very interesting. So. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if you could get a cannonball to splash all the way across. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Lori asks, um, what's a new type of sport that we might try? I think about trying on Mars. Can you think of anything that like could only work on Mars? 
Well, I can think of several things that only work in zero gravity. I mean, you could you could certainly do uh, a lot of zero gravity games. Everything from tag to basketball to uh, any any kind of running sport would would be completely different. Um, on Mars, you've still got some some gravity. I did think about hang gliding there, and actually uh, commissioned an artist to uh, to draw me some pictures of that. But then um, <clears throat> I had somebody work out the <laughs> The physics of it and it turns out that the air on mars is so thin that if you wanted to fly there you would have to have wings that are like 60 meters long they, they'd have to be huge because the air is so so thin which is why they're flying a helicopter not a glider um and that that helicopter has to run at incredibly high speed well uh, they they say when they were testing it here on earth it was super loud because it has to i think they're running at about 3,000 rpm the the blades wow. so uh, just to get enough lift um, so what could we do on Mars that we couldn't do, uh, couldn't do here? Gee, I don't know. That's, that's something interesting to think about. Again, cliff climbing would be easy. You can go up almost vertical cliffs because, uh, with the lower gravity be fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think this one's, uh, related, um, Robert suggests, uh, personal flying. Uh, so on a lower gravity world, if you, uh, could, make a big enough bubble and fill it with higher pressure air? Uh, could you fly under your own power? I know that theoretically is possible on Titan. but mm -hmm. Yeah, Titan's got a nice, uh, nice dense atmosphere and you could probably do it there. That was also the idea of Gerald O'Neill back in the 1970s when he was talking about space colonies, which were gigantic cylinders that were, you know, kilometers long <clears throat> and, um, they were so so voluminous that you would be able to fly. He envisaged um, pedal powered hang gliders that had, they were the triangular hang glider, but with a pedal powered propeller on the back and uh, in the center, again, once you get off the ground, you could, you could fly around that way inside. So you, you'd need a very, very large space, but you also need dense air. You need dense air and that's air and water are expensive to bring into, into space. So, um, but Titan's a good idea. Titan's a good idea. It's kind of low gravity there. Yeah. yeah, there was a the brief discussion. Uh, there was a brief discussion in the comments about how expensive it would be to get um, a swimming pool's uh, worth of water up into space, uh, something like a few tens of trillions of dollars. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I imagine that would be much cheaper if you could get it from uh, an asteroid or a comet. That's true. That's true. We could do that. Maybe we we could just hollow out <clears throat> hollow out a comet. <laughs> excuse me, melt the water and hollow it out mm -hmm. and then spin it. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Let's do that. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I believe that is all of the questions we have for the, uh, from the chat. Uh, I don't know if Amy has any more from the from YouTube chat. Okay. Mm. So oh, no more. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Bob. This has been a fantastic presentation despite the technical difficulties. I'm sure we'll all be uh, going to bed imagining uh, how we're gonna run around on other worlds. Yeah, think about it. Let's have fun up there. And uh, let's not forget uh, after we do all of these things, you know, we'll have all that fun on those other worlds. We're still gonna miss this one. We're still yes. gonna think about home and say, boy, of all the planets, this is still the best of all. Mm -hmm. My favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we'll cozy up uh, next to the uh, nice uh, fireplace slash space heater in our uh, habitat and yeah. uh, read a nice book like an Earthling's Guide to Life in Space. Hey, how about that? <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Bob. Oh, and we've got uh, Ben with his own little Earth there. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I believe Lori wanted to um, try again with. Her, did you want to try again with your presentation there? Um, I could try. I could see. <laughs> All right. It would work. Let's sure. see. How okay. are we doing on time? I think we're just about, uh, it's almost 8.30. So let's see if we can finish off with yours. If not, I can uh, talk a little bit about uh, perseverance. Okay. Let's see if, let's see if this works now. Um, let's try this. All right, there we go. All right.
Um, so I talked about about the Saanich uh, 13 moons, but um, there was there is other uh, ways um, in which other uh, uh, groups of people um, also thought about um, the 13 moons. And if you if there's a, a turtle that has got 13 segments and in the central and eastern regions of Canada and the United States, um, they also looked at um, at uh, the whole story about the turtles back and about um, and about all of all of us living on the living on the turtles back and that each of the 13 uh, segments um, was uh, was part of that. The other the other one that um, if anybody's interested is there is a, a good um, book called Tan's Moons that um, is about all the Haida about how the Haida people from um, uh, from our west coast uh, look at some of their moons as well. And so that that also is another one. Um, I don't think we've got that book in the library uh, in our in our gift shop, but I think we should probably get that. As I said before, uh, we have the the moon of the frog, which is the the Saanich moon for this time of year. Um, in um, in the Haida uh, language, it's called the goose moon, and I guess they do some uh, geese hunting at that point in time. Um, other Northwest cultures, I kind of talked about this just a, a briefly. Um, up in uh, up in Alaska and the Yukon, the the Tingle, uh, people have the Black Bear Moon. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and then the Columbia River is really an interesting one. Um, is they call it the shoulder to shoulder fire moon, and you can almost think about people sitting around a fire and having to be very close in order to be warm. Um, uh, so that that was kind of an interesting uh, an interesting one. Um, in the Oregon, the Kalapua uh, is is it's called out of food. There's this the out of food moon at this time of the year. And then the Stolo, which is in the, um, in Chilliwack, has got I can't pronounce those, but it's it's about um, about getting jammed in a trap or a box or something that that uh, that you get in your hand and you can't you can't take things out from the cold. Kind of a very interesting way of looking at. Um, looking at uh, what we what we think about for the time and what's happening um, with the with the uh, with the moon, and then other other names across North America, of course, is the are the Cree, um, which is called the Old Moon. Uh, the De Lakota is the Snow Moon down there. Cherokee is the Hungry Moon, again being being at a time of year when there's not very much um, food anymore. And then the Mi'kmaq is the Snow Blinding Moon. Um, uh, which I talked about before, and hope you, that you will um, look up look up that. Uh, maybe I'll see if I can put in uh, the chat a uh, the um, the connection to the Mi'kmaq moons um, as that you can have a look at. There's some really good little videos um, online as well for that. And then the um, Ashinagbi is um, is called a bear moon. So if you just all you need to do is just kind of go and think about where some of the cultures are in the world and how how what is happening with them at the time of kind of just between February and March and you can really see what some uh, see what's going on with that. So thanks everybody. I was I, it, it came back on after just a little bit. So I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> if anybody knows any others, uh, let me know for sure. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Lori. And I believe that brings us uh, to just before 830. Um, so I think we'll end it uh, there. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us tonight and uh, struggling with us through our technical difficulties. And uh, we'll try, we're testing out some new uh, technology this time around uh, and the, we're having some growing pains, but hopefully we'll have that all sorted out for next month's uh, Saturday night star party. I hope you'll join us again then. Again, thanks to all of our presenters, especially Bob McDonald and uh, Clear Skies. We'll see you again soon.